Hi, I'm Alan Evans. I'm Head of Marine Policy here at the National Oceanography Centre in the UK. I'm here today with Professor Ed Hill, Chief Executive Officer of the NOC, and we are here to discuss the upcoming uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, COP28. Ed, uh, you've attended a number of COPs. For those who haven't been, can you describe what goes on at a COP? Yes. The main purpose of uh, the COP meetings, which stands for the Conference of the Parties, is where the member states who are part of the Framework Convention meet um, to essentially uh, agree the next steps uh, under the Convention and to review progress uh, that has uh, taken place uh, to date. Um, so uh, there you will find uh, the political leaders, uh, very often heads of state, who will come along and uh, articulate what they have achieved so far, what their ambitions are. There are then uh, negotiators there and there's active negotiations going on at the COP meeting to prepare the text which set out the next rounds of, of commitments. And then there are a range of others, uh, scientists, uh, people from non-governmental organisations, industries, who take that opportunity to uh, press uh, particular aspects of uh, climate change that uh, they think need attention. Um, and there is actually quite a lot of interaction goes on between all of those uh, communities, uh, politicians, uh, policy makers, the uh, negotiators, as well as the scientists, in really a very unique uh, forum that brings everyone together uh, to uh, uh, focus on, on the one issue of, of climate change. Excellent. Thank you, Ed. Um, given we are now at the 28th COP of the UNFCCC, um, not many may be aware that it wasn't until the 25th COP, the so-called Blue COP, as coined by the organisers, that concerted efforts uh, were made to make a link between the climate and the ocean. And it was only last year at the 27th COP where a one ocean voice was represented through a dedicated ocean pavilion. Firstly, why do you think it's taken so long for the role of the ocean in climate to be recognised? And, and secondly, why is it important for NOC and the ocean community to have a voice at the UNFCCC COP? Yeah. Um, it is uh, true that it's been slow in coming for the ocean to get the profile that's uh, uh, needed uh, in relation to climate change. Of course, we as oceanographers have understood that the ocean is vitally important in, in, in the climate system for a very long time. You know, it takes up over 90% of the excess heat, is taking up 25% uh, of the CO2 uh, uh, emissions, the excess emissions, and it represents the... Um, by far the largest reservoir of mobile carbon on, on the planet. So it's, it's obvious to oceanographers that it's important. But um, it's not been um, uh, widely understood in society at large, and particularly by policymakers, that it has a key role. We've tended to focus on it as an atmospheric problem caused by emissions. Um, and yet the role of the ocean, both as a source and a sink of carbon dioxide really um, has not been prominent in the thinking. Probably because, um, as in many other cases, the ocean is somewhat out of sight and, and out of mind. Um, but that has been increasingly recognised. For example, the, U uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, uh, did a dedicated report uh, on the ocean and the cryosphere system, which really helped to raise the profile of the role of the ocean. There have always been ocean chapters within the IPCC reports, but that very dedicated special issue, I think, brought to attention uh, that, that issue. The reason it has started to become more prominent in the thinking is that the ocean is not... Uh, just a major player in the carbon cycle that is regulating the climate. But people are starting to recognise that it might be the source of a number of solutions to the climate problem. And that is where um, 
I think the attention is increasingly focused, and why it's it's welcome now that the ocean is gaining increasing prominence in the uh, in in the discussion. And would that be the reason why the NOC and, and the ocean community need to have this greater voice at the UNFCCC COP? Absolutely, scientists. Uh, uh, are really trying to hammer this message home. In fact, uh, marine scientists did uh, a good job, uh, and led by scientists from the, 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 the UK, in getting one aspect of the ocean onto the climate agenda, which was the whole question of ocean acidification, which is the other half of the CO2 problem. You know, the, the bit of the CO2 that's in the atmosphere is mm -hmm. global warming, and the bit that goes into the ocean is uh, causing acidification with all sorts of ramifications. So, so that has been a very good example of getting one ex aspect of, of oceans into the climate um, uh, dialogue. Um, but yes, we've been trying to raise the, the, the prominence of it, which is why uh, at COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh, we had the very first ever ocean pavilion, um, where all the major oceanographic institutions in, in the world came together very large number of them, uh, and Nock was a member, to actually have a very clear physical presence um, to run a set of uh, dialogues and discussions uh, around the ocean. And it really was a very dynamic hub of uh, all sorts of people were coming along, political leaders, scientists, uh, the curious about the ocean, um, uh, as a really uh, dynamic centre, which really helped to um, put the ocean on the agenda, um, both you know, physically as a place to meet and talk mm -hmm. about it, um, but also uh, just to remind everybody, you know, there's a, there's a big issue here and uh, this is uh, something we need to take, uh, take care of, which is why we're very keen to follow this up now at COP28 and build on the momentum that we started uh, in Egypt mm -hmm. and to carry that carry that forward with this really important message about the ocean. Okay, before we move on to COP28, I'd like to just unpick a little bit. You just alluded to the Ocean Pavilion at the COP27 last year uh, and the importance of having that one ocean voice. So can, can you just share a little bit more? How, how does NOC work with other institutions through that Ocean Pavilion to help promote the ocean within the COP? Because we know the ocean is too large for any one co country to yes, deal with. Yes. Now, that collaboration piece must be very important. So, yes. so there are uh, huge amounts of scientific uh, collaboration go on between these institutions. Uh, we work on major scientific questions. We cooperate around the innovation of many of the technologies for observing the ocean. Um, many of the big oceanographic institutions of which we are uh, a key player uh, are the institutions that actually operate the global ocean observing system, which is part mm -hmm. of the global climate observing system. Um, so we have very strong capabilities in making the measurements, those vital measurements, which inform the whole of the policy uh, discussion. So yeah. those are the those are the ways in which we work together on the ground. Um, but we are increasingly uh, trying to bring our voices together as one uh, to be more prominent. So which is why uh, in COP28, uh, uh, we are collectively contributing to a declaration, uh, which will be known as the uh, Dubai Declaration, um, to argue uh, for uh, sustained global observations relating to the oceans and climate as the absolute bedrock for providing the evidence that we need um, for the decisions that we need to take and to evaluate whether the actions that we are taking in respect of the ocean and the climate system as a whole are working and that is a vital part of it. So we'll be making that joint statement together. Excellent. And would you say the drafting or the, the coming together of that declaration is as a result of some of the outcomes from COP27 last year. Uh, uh, would you like to share what some of those may have been, which has 
provided the momentum into this year's declaration. Yes. In fact, um, you can trace uh, history from uh, COP25, actually, which was uh, to have been hosted in Chile, but uh, uh, was actually held in Madrid, which was known as the Blue COP, um, which was where the ocean really started to come onto the agenda through to uh, COP26, which was uh, held in held in Glasgow, which carried forward some of that momentum. And that is where we started to see nature-based solutions as ways of uh, uh, protecting and then restoring carbon sinks, mm -hmm. both on land, but at that COP, uh, some of the marine carbon sinks started to come onto the agenda uh, through into, uh, into COP27. And COP27, um, actually had a dedicated section uh, on the ocean in the final uh, declaration. It encouraged the parties to the convention to think about ocean-based actions uh, in the context of their national goals. Um, and it also drew attention uh, to some important gaps in the global climate observing system and called out the ocean uh, as one of those. So those are the kinds of things uh, that have happened and we're looking to build on that recognition as as we go forward and certainly um, we realized uh, as ocean pavilion partners that um, we firstly got a presence uh, and in the uh, next cop which is this one uh, it was time to go beyond a presence and start to have a voice yeah. um, and that's where where we're going well see ocean pavilion and, and enables a scientific to come scientific community to come together we also have as you just alluded to at cop 27 for the first time the ocean dialogues which is the political agenda which was established following cop 25 for the for the decision makers and the policy makers to come together to have that higher level discussion yes. is that now seemingly bringing the political agenda and the scientific agenda do we see now that there are pathways to those to actually starting to talk together even more so yes absolutely because uh, with the best will in the world uh, uh, scientists are providing the advice but it's only when this gets into the formalities of the uh, process and the political process that we that that is what leads to action so part of the formalities of the cop process has been these ocean climate dialogues which the idea of that uh, started uh, COP25 and we've now on our third uh, ocean climate dialogue. So in the run-up to uh, to this uh, COP in Bonn earlier this year, uh, were uh, a, 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 round, a range of dialogues related to this. In fact, the themes that were the, the foci of that were around uh, restoring um, blue carbon habitats in, in coastal regions, and also about uh, sustainable uh, fishing and use of uh, uh, you know, food resources. Yeah. So they're now actually getting into the formal process, and eventually that is what gets you into the change, uh, into the change and into the agreement texts okay. eventually. So it's a, a long process, takes time, but it's, it's starting to get there. You alluded to process there, and the UN does have its processes and they do take time. And this year we've seen a couple of significant um, agreements within the UN. We have the new agreements for the high seas. Um, and we also have the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework Agreement, both of which will help enable protect up to 30% of the ocean, or they provide the frameworks to protect 30% of the ocean. Given that momentum, and now we have COP28 and everything we've discussed about, the, the, the increasing relevance of ocean within the UNFCCC COP, how do you see this COP28 adding to that momentum going into maybe 2024? Yes, it's, it's part of a process. You can't look at any one of these uh, in isolation. Um, and essentially what they are doing is building momentum and a, uh, and a movement uh, collectively, and that's... How they how they need to be viewed and, and, and seen. Um, increasingly, it's being recognised that the you know the the triple issues that we're facing in the ocean 
uh, is the nexus of climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution. And these are all interrelated. Um, they're actually being dealt with by separate processes, uh, particularly climate and biodiversity, climate through the framework convention, biodiversity within the areas of national jurisdiction, largely um, through the, um, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity process. And now we have this new and very important player on the block, the uh, uh, so-called BBNJ process, uh, the High Seas Treaty relating to sustainable management of biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. So, um, as, is, as is said, uh, increasingly, um, ocean action is climate action and climate action is ocean action. And actually protecting biodiversity is not disconnected from the climate change issue for two reasons. Climate change is one of the stresses that impacts uh, the biodiversity on the, on, on the planet, but also by protecting uh, marine habitats, you uh, can also simultaneously be protecting important carbon sinks and preventing more carbon getting into the atmosphere. And actually by restoring and enhancing them, you're actually increasing carbon sinks. So these things really need to be looked at, at together. And so looking forward, um, you can see a whole uh, series of things going forward. Next year in um, Barcelona, in uh, April, we will have the uh, UN Decade of Ocean Science second um, uh, science conference, which will start to bring together the concerted scientific activity around these areas. Uh, then a series of, of other events, and eventually going through into 2025 in Nice, the UN Ocean Conference, and that is a way of starting to bring this together. And we're starting to see the beginnings of a process of trying to bring together the assessments like IPCC and those assessments relating to the state of the ocean and its biodiversity to begin to see whether these processes might be brought uh, together in some more concerted way. So um, this uh, movement, I think, will increasingly see uh, are beginning to fuse the, the questions of climate, biodiversity, and indeed uh, pollution stresses in the ocean as, uh, as interconnected because many of the sh solutions of them are common. And indeed, some of the best solutions that we can find address all three problems uh, simultaneously. So taking a joined up uh, look at this is, is, is really important. Okay, thanks, Ed. Um, you alluded to addressing the solutions now. The NOC uh, is one of the major research organisations in the UK helping to provide the knowledge and information to help address those. So bringing it back to a lower level, to the NOC, what is the NOC doing at COP28 this year and, and, and what are our key asks uh, within that forum? Yes, so there's a, a number of things we're doing. Uh, let's, uh, firstly, we're, our, our asks are not in isolation from everyone else. And so in terms of... Um, uh, what we're doing is that our collective voice with the other partners there around the Dubai Declaration really uh, calling for uh, the sustained observing system for the ocean to be put on a sustainable footing because without data, without the information, that is the, the core to the evidence to plan actions, to evaluate their effectiveness. Um, to keep us alert to the surprises that we know the changing climate system will mm -hmm. throw up. Um, so that is absolutely uh, vital. And as scientific organisations, which is our, uh, our, our common feature, um, we are absolutely committed to the undertaking and ensuring you know, the best scientific evidence and research and data is available because that informs everything going forward. Mm -hmm. So that is our number one ask, uh, along with uh, everyone else. Uh, in addition, though, uh, the NOC within the pavilion um, is going to be hosting a number of uh, events and, and debates, particularly uh, around uh, blue carbon is one that we're looking at. Um, these are uh, coastal carbon sinks that are important to protect and enhance. 
Um, we're also looking at the, uh, uh, we'll be uh, leading a discussion around the role of plankton as indicators of climate change. And then very importantly, we bid for and were successful in getting from the COP itself uh, an official uh, side event, uh, which we are um, co-hosting with the World Ocean Council, which is a range of industry uh, partners. In fact, we were asked by COP to work together because we'd both put together uh, a very similar t topic. And that is around the question of carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere, which is an important part of all of the pathways to net zero that we do need to be able to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. There are a number of potential solutions of trying to accelerate the rate at which the ocean uh, could take up carbon dioxide um, to you know, have solutions which are um, ocean-based carbon dioxide removal. However, our main call there is there are huge uncertainties around this um, in terms of what would be the environmental impacts of this, how effective actually is it, um, is it something that can operate at scale, and could you monitor and verify um, you know, the, 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 the carbon storage that was uh, working. And there are lots of uncertainties in, in the way in which the ocean carbon cycle works. So uh, there's a lot of interest in ocean-based carbon dioxide removal, um, but again, our key role as scientific institutions is to ensure that um, we don't get ahead of ourselves with that. There's a, a lot of optimism, a lot of enthusiasm, but it perhaps needs to be tempered in terms of what the scientific evidence uh, is showing. We don't want to. We don't want a cure that's worse than the disease. Um, and so we really want uh, to highlight there the importance of uh, uh, more research. Um, targeted research and accelerating the pace of research in this area to get to the answers quickly as to whether these options are viable or, or not. Um, so that's something we're going to be leading. It's very important. Thanks, Ed. Um, last question, um, maybe a big one. You, you alluded to the Ocean Pavilion Declaration there. So what, what difference, and given everything that you just alluded to in, in, in during this discussion, what difference should this COP make in support of that ocean climate nexus, what would be that one big ask of this COP to help organizations such as the NOC to understand what it is that's required to deal with that political process? Yeah, I think the, the well, the key thing is just to keep the momentum going on the number one uh, priority for addressing uh, the climate issue, which is uh, uh, reducing the emissions and keeping the pace of that going. It's slow, it's too slow, the science is quite clear what happens if we uh, don't reduce those uh, emissions faster than we are now. And so that's the number one thing, is just to keep keep that, that going. Um, to also to understand um, what we need to do to adapt to climate change, but also um, something that was very prominent at COP27 is around ensuring that no one is left behind in this uh, whole progress to reducing emissions and that uh, you know those countries that are most affected by climate change, including the least developed countries, the small island developing states, uh, are equipped with the means both to um, be able to respond, to mitigate their own impacts and to adapt uh, and to keep the pressure on, on that. And I keep coming back to the science. Um, climate science is not a done problem. Um, we, we, we know in headline terms what's happening, but we don't yet fully understand how these play out at regional level to be able to better inform and predict uh, uh, what kind of responses need to be taken at local level um, to, to manage the, the issue. And we do know that the climate system is capable of throwing up surprises. Indeed, 2023 has been a big surprise for a lot of climate scientists. We have seen unprecedented warming in the ocean. It's just way off the scale 
of what anybody ever predicted. It really is a surprise. We don't really understand uh, why this is such an exceptional year, but it is. Um, is it that beginning of something different or is it just going to flop back to the normal range of where it's been? Um, these are really important issues and we need to get ahead of these because uh, they make big differences to the pace at which the climate uh, system is evolving and the rate at which we may need to adapt and we may need to you know, rethink some of our climate trajectories depending on what the system is doing. And this is why we just keep needing the information and the data to tell us what is, is going on. Because when you've got a, the Earth system in such a um, disequilibrated state, you know, it is way out of where it has been for a very long time. You just cannot live in a world like that without a better um, dashboard to show you what's going on. And that's, uh, that's where we as scientists have got the key role to play. That's excellent. Thank you very much, Ed. And as you alluded to there, it is a global problem. And whether you're from a developed state or a developing state, I think we all need to work together in that space. And I think that it's incumbent on those developed countries to help those that are less able to contribute to this piece of work. So thank you very much on that, 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 that significant uh, conclusion to this interview. So. On that, I'd like to finish there. Thank you very much. Um, if there's more information that you'd like uh, on this, please uh, uh, head to www.noc.ac.uk forward slash news, where you'll see some information on NOx uh, involvement in climate change research, as well as our participation at COP28. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Alan.